Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Now if you came here today expecting to see Tom Cruise, forget it. We got something better. We have a guy who has really survived some of the toughest training and flying environments that the world has to offer. And more importantly, the world's flying environments have survived him. Ladies and gentlemen, Top Gun pilot and instructor, Captain Mike Rabins. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I had to put these on to come in because I wanted to look cool, but I'm going to take them off now. <laughs> so so um, it is absolutely a pleasure to be here. And for those of you that are part of the museum, you know that this is an incredible resource for our kids, for the community, and I hope uh, you will consider continuing to support the museum. If you are not part of the museum family, I would urge you to join. It's very inexpensive to be a member, and all that adds up to provide the funding to keep all this going. So, so Cindy does a great job, uh, great leadership with Mike Seminera, and, and I couldn't um, be more proud of what they have here. And we bring Northrop Grumman engineers here all the time. Roy Martin, our retired chief test pilot, does a lot here so that the kids can see what's going on in aviation by looking at the real product. It's not academic, it's not a PowerPoint brief, it's not a video on YouTube, it's real. So this is an incredible resource, please support it. It's a pleasure to see you, Mr. Cressa. Pleasure to see you, Mike. And uh, if you wanna learn about the technical aspects of the airplane, Mike Simonera is both on video and in this book talking about what became, um, you know, how, how the Grumman design philosophy worked. And in a speech that he gave here many years ago, uh, just a few years ago actually, <laughs> he did talk a lot about the F-14. It's the best technical summation of what went into the design of the F-14. I think you could see uh, it can't be beat and, and it's, it's easily findable on YouTube. So I would, uh, I would recommend that. Um, what we're gonna do today is uh, introduce myself in the F-14 a bit, talk about Top Gun, uh, which I had the pleasure to go through, and talk, you know, really try and get into what it was like to be a student going through Top Gun, and then talk a little bit about what comes after when you're a pilot and you graduate or a radar intercept officer, and you go back to a squadron, you've got a whole nother job you've gotta do. Um, and then talk a little bit about the movie. Uh, I'll take Q&A here, but then we'll move out by the airplane because I like standing next to that beautiful beast and uh, I'm happy to take any questions out there until you get tired. So, um, let's talk a little bit about some other things that are out there. So I mentioned Mike's book. Um, Bio Baranek has written several books. He's got three out now. And he had, I mean, if you want to read about what it's like to be a Top Gun student, and then he went back as an instructor, I highly recommend him. Uh, good books. There's other books out there that kind of complement the movie. The movie is Hollywood. Some of it's real, some of it's not. We'll come back to the end. Um, and of course, uh, if you want to know really about it, there's probably 50 books out there about Top Gun, but I highly recommend Bio Baranek's books. And you can also find him on YouTube giving talks in various places. So I was very lucky. I went to school on a ROTC scholarship at the University of Virginia and got my degree and I was selected to go to flight training about six weeks later. So I went to Pensacola. Uh, then I went to Texas for jet training and I, my dream came true. You know, I was a young man and I got orders to go fly F-14s. And at that time, you never really knew. When you got your wings, you never really knew where you were gonna go. You could go fly A-3s, you could go fly A-7s, A-6s, E-A-6s, F-14s. You just didn't know, but I wanted to fly the F-14. I wanted to be down at Miramar right down the road. And, uh, and my dream came true, I got to go do that. Uh, I started flying in 1979, got my wings in 81, first flew the F-14 in 81. And then um, after Top Gun, went back and I did the things I'll talk about in a minute at the squadron. And at the end of that, uh, I was double lucky. I got to go to a test pilot school. And, um, and then I went back to a fleet tour. Then I went into the acquisition side. And uh, my last active duty job was as the wing commander up at Point Magoo, 
and that was an awesome job, which we could talk about another time, Cindy, but testing airplanes at Point Magoo in China Lake. And after that, I went to work for Raytheon. I took over the old Howard Hughes flight test group, which at that point had moved to Van Nuys, started in Culver City. And after six years there, a friend uh, approached me and said, didn't you used to run carrier suitability testing in the Navy? And I said, yes. He says, well, we've got this X-47, and we're going to take it to the ship, and we want to know if you'd like to lead that team. So that pulled me right over to North of Grumman, and I've been there ever since. I'm currently the director of test right up the road in Palmdale for Edwards, Palmdale, and, and all the Antelope Valley sites. So that's me. And that's the F-14. <laughs> so um, it just, uh, the whole history of the F-14 is, is out there, and I want to talk a little bit more about Top Gun, but I can't really talk about flying the F-14 at Top Gun without telling you a little bit about the airplane. When I was in my first squadron, it was F-14As. When I went back after my first test tour, it was an F-14As. So that first column there, it, that's the airplane I flew. 17,000 pounds of thrust from each engine, the original vision for the F-14 was that the first 30 airplanes were going to have that, that engine, the TF-30 from Pratt & Whitney, and then we were going to go to a bigger motor. We got there eventually, and I did get a chance to fly the, both the B and the D, and you can see quite a bit more thrust, 34,000 pounds of thrust up to uh, nearly 58,000 pounds of thrust, and that makes a big difference because when you're fighting the airplane, when you're not just trying to go from A to B, the more thrust you can have, the better. I mean, there, nobody has ever said, oh, I don't need that much thrust. You know, no one's ever said that. So uh, the F-14B and the D were, were, were truly phenomenal. You can see some of the other stats there. Um, it was a big airplane. It had two tails for a reason. It had to fit in the hangar bay. So to give directional stability, it's got two tails. And again, Mike Sinera can talk a lot about why the F-14 design is what it is, but it was a magnificent airplane to fly. It was fast, could carry a lot. Uh, during most of my time, we were carrying a lot of air-to-air -air weapons. Later on, it became an incredible platform for air-to-ground weapons as well with precision strike, the lantern pod, and all that. In fact, on its last cruise, uh, right before retirement in 2006, it was, I think, by far the platform of choice for our forces in Afghanistan and Iraq because it could stand station a long time and it could do the job. And, and it, it was just you know, a fitting end for the airplane. I'm sorry that it ended, but it went out with a bang. It went out in grand style. Here's a schematic of the airplane. Probably most of you are familiar with the airplane itself. Um, you know, twin engine, twin tail, supersonic, fighter. So you had a cockpit with great visibility. You had all the things you expected for a carrier airplane to have. The swing wing allowed you to be supersonic uh, with a, a low parasitic drag, low drag count and maneuver. And then with the wings out, you could come back and land at the carrier at a relative approach speed, assuming the carrier is going, say, 20 knots of, you know, 110, 115 miles an hour. That made landing on the carrier much easier. Um, beefy gear, which we'll see as, and as you walk by the airplane, you saw that. Um, did not have fly-by-wire flight controls, but the Grumman design was elegant. They had a stability augmentation system that was very effective, and then that got improved as time went on until we finally had what was called DFCS, which made the airplane fly better than the Hornet. Now, the Hornet had nice flying qualities, uh, but uh, it took a while for the Air 14 to get there, uh, mostly due to the way the Navy was funding upgrades. But when you had DFCS and an F-14D, you were king of the hill. It was awesome. Carried a lot of weapons. Now, this is an older picture from the era when I was flying the airplane. And you can see the sidewinders in the front of that picture. Uh, there's a gun you can't see, but when we go out to the airplane, I'll show you where it was in there, the Mark 61, 20 millimeter. Uh, seeing the high explosive ordnance rounds go off when you were strafing was, was something to behold. That alone made the F-14 very potent compared to 
what it replaced, which was the F4, which didn't have an internal gun. And we'll come back to that. Uh, the Sidewinder short range missile, the Sparrow, which was the radar guarded missile, that was the missile that the F4 carried. It was the primary medium range air to air missile. And what was new about the F14 was the AIM 54 Phoenix. We had a radar that could see out 100 miles or maybe more. We had a missile that could go out and touch somebody. You could fire that missile in greater than 50 miles away, and it was a big missile, and it would go out there, and it had a big warhead, and it had its own active radar. So in the end game, if you tactically needed to turn and go prosecute some other targets, the missile would lock onto the target, and that was revolutionary. That was game changing. That was something nobody had at that time. Nobody had the AUG-9 radar system and the AIM-54 Phoenix, and all, they all got upgraded, eventually APG-71 radar, AIM-54C Phoenix, just amazing capability in the 70s. Nobody could match it. Nobody, none of our enemies, uh, and even other US fighters didn't have that kind of range. So it was pretty incredible. The airplane was designed to be able to do air to ground ordnance, but I'll be honest with you, until I went back uh, at the at the end of my career as the test wing commander, it was not the main focus. It became the focus when they started embracing more of a strike fighter role, put the lantern pot on, put night vision goggles in, and, and made it uh, more of a multi-role fighter. Had that capability all along, but it just wasn't embraced by the Navy until a little bit later. And the ordinance that you see there is basically uh, dumb bombs and some other guided munitions, but at the end, when, with JDAM and JSAO and the other precision guided weapons, it was an amazing weapons platform. Configured different ways. This was actually a very slick configuration because the sparrows in the belly, there were four stations in the belly, and in this configuration, you had the two forward missiles side by side, and then serially behind that. Um, it actually reduced the drag of the airplane. The belly of the F-14 is big. You can see when you walk around it. And it actually created lift and did a lot of good things for the performance of the airplane. Putting the sparrows there actually reduced the drag slightly, and so it didn't slow you down at all. When you put things on airplanes, it takes performance away, but these did not. So it was pretty, pretty cool. And the, and the sparrow missile, you know, we're talking 20 to 30 mile range, so you could reach out and touch the enemy, but you're still getting much closer than you were with the Phoenix. When you're flying with the Phoenix, this would be a typical, well, this is not quite a typical configuration. This is what you would look like with six Phoenix, and that's a lot of money in missiles, and pounding them on and off the aircraft carrier would actually, you know, take a toll on the missiles over time. So we would typically fly with one or two when we were deployed, and sparrows and sidewinders. So you'd have all missiles on board, but this is what it would look like if you were gonna carry four, I'm sorry, six, with the drop tanks, which go under the uh, inlet and the cells. So um, probably most of you know a little bit about the airplane, and now let's talk about what happened. So the kill ratio in World War II was 14 to one. In other words, our World War II fighter pilots shot down 14 enemy airplanes for every one loss that we had. And it was still pretty good in Korea. It was 12 to one. So every time they went out and they tangled with the bogeys or the bandits, um, you know, 12 of their airplanes would go down versus one of ours. In Vietnam, the calculus changed for a whole lot of reasons, but we were running about 2.5 to one, and that was not good. First of all, our airplanes were more expensive, they were more advanced, they shouldn't have been, you know, they should have had air superiority without question. And some of you may uh, know quite a bit about this and we get into Q&A, um, I may ask for a lifeline because I was not uh, in the Vietnam War, but, um, Things like the enemy knowing that the F-4 didn't have guns, the MiGs would actually turn in front of the F-4 if they were coming in for a pass. I'm not supposed to use my hands as a Top Gun graduate, but I'm gonna do it just for a minute. You know, coming into that pass, they would actually start lead turning the F-4s, and 
even though they couldn't match the speed of the F4, they could get off a gunshot. You know, so we had gun pods the Air Force could carry, but the enemy figured out how to take advantage of things. So they commissioned uh, Frank Alt, who was an uh, you know, experienced aviator, to go do this study and figure out what, what was going on. So these were the questions that they were asked. And this was, this was a big deal because uh, you don't want to have a war where you know, you're only a two to one or a two and a half to one kill ratio. We pride ourselves on having the best equipment and the best pilots and we want to annihilate the enemy. So they asked, is industry delivering the right capability? And I'm not talking about just the F-14, but the, the weapons, the missiles that we were carrying, everything that we did. Are the fleet support organizations supporting that equipment? In other words, can it be repaired quickly? Can it be repaired on the carrier? Does it have to come back to the states? Do shipboard and squadron organizations launch you know, a fully up weapon system every time it goes flying? And if not, why not? Does the combat air crew fully understand the weapon system and how to exploit it? That's important if to, and all this leads to Top Gun. Finally, you know, is the air-to-air -air missile system, and that's everything from the missile to the radar behind it, is that returning a quality product back to the fleet? So they wanted to know why we weren't doing as well as we should have been, given that we had great pilots and good airplanes. So it's a very long, you can actually find it on the internet now. The Alt Report uh, has been declassified, and most of the comments and the findings, if you will, in the alt report were about the weapon system. You know, why were the missiles not working? And, you know, what were the root causes? Well, some of it was because pounding on and off the carrier, the early versions had less reliability. Some of it went back to the air crew firing out of the envelope. You had, you couldn't be too close to the enemy or the missile wouldn't fuse. You couldn't be too far away or didn't have the kinematic energy to get there. So they, they looked at all of this, and they made a lot of recommendations about how to, and, to, and he was part of the Naval Air Systems Command, so a lot of recommendations were about making the systems better, systems more reliable, more repairable, and making sure the resources are there to do that. That's actually the bulk of the report. But importantly, especially for this talk today, they recommended that an advanced fighter weapons school be created to address the lack of proficiency in dissimilar air combat. People simply weren't that good at it. There was a feeling as we went from F-8s and F-4s, uh, you know, in the war, and we had A-7s and A-6s out there too. There was a feeling out there, you know, that the Sparrow missile was going to eliminate the enemy at range, and we were not going to end up in a dogfight. We weren't going to. Just, it was going to be a rarity, but that's not what was happening in Vietnam. So they said, we've got to get people's proficiency up. We have to make them competent in uh, air combat maneuvering. And the way to do that was to have an air, uh, a squadron. It started off as a detachment with, within the F-4 training squadron, and then it became its own squadron. We had to have a squadron with dissimilar aircraft so that people could learn how to fight dissimilar aircraft and prevail in air combat. One of the other things they did is they determined that we needed some kind of training system so that people would be able to go back and reconstruct a flight and you could learn where you were out of the envelope. Now the weapons got better. The AIM-9 Sidewinder, you originally had to be basically at between the enemies five and seven o'clock and then they got better and better. And now you can, if you get a heat signature head on, you can use an AIM-9 Sidewinder against the enemy. But it wasn't always like that. So in this time, we had a lot of shots where the missiles were just not getting there because they were out of the envelope. And they, with this range, which you saw in the movie Top Gun, if you saw it, uh, air combat maneuvering instrumentation or tactical air combat training system, it had, just, had various names along the way. But you could, put a tracking beacon on each airplane and you could see exactly what the angles off were, what the range was, what the speeds were during the fight, which came in handy for both things. It came in handy for seeing uh, where you were uh, employing that weapon system accurately within the envelope, and it also took the guessing game out of who won the fight. 
We had a saying when I went to Miramar, first one to the blackboard wins. We, we, didn't, we had blackboards, not whiteboards back then. But if you were the one up there kind of describing how the fight went, you know, your memory might be a little more favorable to you and a little less favorable to the enemy. <laughs> well, you know, we all have a bit of an ego. And so um, it, took, it took all that out. Basically, it was a representation of exactly what happened in that flight. So these were very, very important findings from the Alt Report. And the Navy took it seriously. And they did create uh, Top Gun. And they did put uh, air combat maneuvering instrumentation ranges anywhere. The first one was at Yuma. They now have them at Fallon, Yuma. And the Air Force uses them at Nellis and all over. So they're fairly ubiquitous now. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like it, to be in a squadron pre-Top Gun and then going through Top Gun and then a little bit after. So you show up, you're full of vim and vigor, you show up at Miramar, you're happy as a clam because you were selected to fly F-14s, and you find out pretty quickly, uh, and I'll talk about the training in a moment, you find out pretty quickly, though, that everyone is focused, completely focused. You know, you learn to fly the airplane to its limits, and you want to fly it as often as you can, and you want to learn how to win. Your reputation in a squadron is completely uh, built around you know, not what you look like, Tom Cruise, or what, you know, Maverick or Goose, but it's all about how well you employ that airplane. Can you win? Because you want winners in a fire squadron. And you want people that can lead the team to winning, off, just like sports in many ways. And so that, that was the focus going in. So go through the RAG, uh, uh, Fleet Replacement Squadron. And uh, at that time, you know, in 1981, when I showed up, it was, a, there were a lot of, airplanes there. We had f 8 still, we had f 4s still, we had F-14s, and the F-4 squadrons were transitioning to F-14s, you know, two at a time. There's two F-14 squadrons, or two F-4 squadrons in each air wing. And so while I was there, I got to seal that. So going through Top Gun, you had F-4s, you had F-14s, and when I went through, we actually had the first F-18s go through uh, Top Gun from VX-4, which was the developmental uh, tactics development test squadron at Point Magoo. Um, you go through some preliminaries. You get, you get to go out and do, practice out of control maneuvering recovery in the T2 because you could spin the T2 all day and you didn't want to spin an F-14. Uh, if you saw the movie, you know why. And um, then you get to the actual rag itself, which is about six months long. And I was very lucky. I started in MAG. I finished with my carrier qualifications in December. So it was literally almost exactly six months for me. And you go to the, you're then selected to go to a squadron, and you've got, you've got to, you have to have 50 hours in the airplane to go carrier qualification. So most people go to their first squadron with about 200 and so hours from training and about 50 to 70 hours in the F-14. So you show up at your squadron pretty green. Um, when I went to my first squadron, I uh, got there in January, and we were going on cruise shortly, so the squadrons go through this workup cycle. Now, when I joined the squadron, we had Top Gun graduates in the squadron already in leadership roles. Uh, the training officer was a Top Gun graduate, and some of the department heads were Top Gun graduates. And so we, as a squadron, learned how to, you know, to, to operate off the ship and to do all the missions, you know, air to air intercepts and other things that we were training to do so that when we were deployed, if we needed to, if something happened, we could respond with force. Um, we go through all the workups and then we go on cruise. And I must admit that as you go through successive cruises, the excitement wears off a little bit because you're away from your family and your home and all. But the first time you go, everything's new. So. We go on the USS Enterprise, it's an eight month cruise, and we went through the North Pacific and then the Sea of Japan, and we got to see things that most people didn't at that time. The carriers had typically been operating around uh, the Sea of Japan, around the Philippines where we had a base, and, and, and then uh, doing exercises with joint nations. Reagan was president, and he wanted to poke the bear a little bit. So we went up to North Pacific and operated along the Aleutian Islands. And then we went into the Sea of Japan. And because of that, the Russians, at that time, they, you know, they wanted to show their force. They wanted to poke us back. And so there were a lot of interesting things going on. Um, 
where you know, we were doing lights out intercepts of planes to see if, was it an airliner or was it a bomber? And you can see the list of intercepts. That's just me, not my whole squadron. You know, and it was pretty cool to see the enemy. And sometimes the enemy, I think it was the reservists, they were kind of friendly, they'd wave, and sometimes they were not friendly. They would try and fly you into the water. They would um, point their rear-facing gun radars at you. Of course, in the F-14, we had a very high power out radar, so if they pointed their guns at us, we'd simply take a single target track on them, and they'd pretty soon, you know, then you see the gun barrels go up as they, you know, they broke the lock. Because they did not want to be irradiated by that very powerful radar. But, but it, was, it was a heady time. We went uh, after the um, Sea of Japan. We eventually went into the Indian Ocean, and we were there for a very long time. And, um, and then with, when you're in that mode, you're training with your other air wing assets. When you're around the other, company, uh, the other countries, excuse me, uh, you do exercises with them, the Philippine Air Force or the Malaysian Air Force or uh, Singapore Air Force, et cetera. But once you get out in the Indian Ocean, at least back then, there really wasn't anybody to train with uh, except the Air Force of Oman. Uh, we, we did do some work with them. So um, you're now, you know, you're training, you're, you've got drop tanks on, you're flying a heavier airplane, and you're trying to fight and learn from the other people that know how to fight that airplane. But it's, it's a little bit, uh, you're a little bit encumbered by the, the fact that you're tied to an aircraft carrier cycle where you can't just come back and land when you're out of gas. You have to wait till the recovery. And, and so it's a little bit constraining for training, but it's good because during that first deployment, you're flying a lot. You're flying almost every day, probably, you know, typically 20 to 25 days out of the month you'd fly. Sometimes you'd fly twice. And so you're learning the airplane. You're getting comfortable in the airplane. You're, you're, you're going from that, oh my God, I've only got, you know, 70 hours in the airplane phase and don't let me screw it up, to building confidence, which is good because you'll need it. Um, so I came back from that cruise and uh, another first tour guy and I and two Rios were kind of, they were considering both of us for Top Gun and I didn't pay anybody off, but somehow I got lucky and uh, a guy named Glenn Mickle and I were selected to go to Top Gun. So that was the summer of, of uh, 83, so quite a long time ago now. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the syllabus. We get back from deployment, you've got um, a lot of the parts, the electronic warfare gear and other things go to the squadrons getting ready to deploy and you don't have as much money. So I think I didn't fly for about a whole month. And then once they made the selection of who was going to attend, they let us get warmed up. They let us get back in the air and fly some before we started. The Top Gun program itself, it's longer now, but at that time, it was a very, very intense five weeks. Uh, intense is probably an understatement because you feel like you're going to either completely cement a good reputation or you're going to ruin your reputation and it'll be a long time, if ever, before you can outlive it. So the objective of Top Gun was to, you know, learning from the Alt Report, was to develop, refine, and teach aerial dogfight skills. And it was a train-the-trainer program. You went through, the squadron would only get one crew between every cruise. They couldn't put everybody through Top Gun. There were other adversary squadrons that had other programs. Uh, strike fighter weapons programs and uh, fleet aircraft readiness programs, but they could only afford to send a few people through the course because it basically went through with, you know, 12 airplanes, which was 24 crews except for the single seat airplanes, so less than 24 crews. And you were then expected to come back and teach, so you're, they're teaching you how to be an instructor. So teaching and learning was a big part of the Top Gun syllabus. Not as sexy in the, you know, the movies, but very important. Briefing and debriefing, there's a whole style to it that it can either promote learning or can, can promote you know, ego competition. Learning about the weapon system, more than you ever knew when you went through the fleet replacement squadron, you learned about the airplane but I would say, you know, to the five foot depth level, maybe, and then as you stayed in the squadron, it got deeper and deeper. When you went through Top Gun, 
you were at the 100 foot deep level. You were really in the details so that you could learn the way to optimize your employment of the weapon system. And then you equally learned about the threat. You had classified briefs about what the current threats were in all different parts of the world, what their tactics were, what they were working on for development. And the whole focus was on, if you will, a scientific approach. A scientific approach to creating a scenario where you could optimize your airplane, exploit the enemy's weaknesses, and win. Because you were a precious resource. There are only so many airplanes on the carrier, and you wanted to win and prevail in air combat every time. At the same time, the instructors were the best instructors I've ever seen anywhere. I'm, pick a university, pick any training squadron in any service, Air Force, Navy, Army, Marine Corps, it doesn't matter. They were the best, and they, they honed that skill. So they were modeling to us as we were going through how to be an instructor. Because when you went back to your squadron, that's essentially what you were going to be. You were the train the trainer guy, and you're going to go back to your squadron, and now you were going to be training your entire squadron. So they modeled that behavior, and I have to say, the most professional instructors, again, that I've ever seen. It was amazing. They could give a two-hour lecture on a particular weapon system. You could talk coherently, and they could basically, with no notes, you know, they, they had a mastery of the subject, and that was a real good example for me about how to take that back to the squadron. The flights, you know, you had classes every day, and then you had the flights. And you started off with a performance demonstration. You can academically talk about which airplanes have which advantages in which areas. And we have these things called VN diagrams where you're looking at specific excess thrust and where, where can you out accelerate the enemy airplane and when, where can you out turn the enemy airplane. But you need, you need that visceral experience of going out and experiencing too. So you would actually start the whole syllabus with a performance demo where you go out with either the A4 shown here or the F5 and you would, you would do acceleration runs, you would do turns so you could physically see where the, um, where the advantages were. And then you start off with 1v1s and then 1v2s and then 2v2s and you can see the progression there. You're going from how do I employ my airplane to how do I employ a section which is the standard tactical deployment in the Navy, to a division. Now you've got four fighters. Oh my God, four F-14s out there. That's four weapon systems, all those missiles. You ought to be able to wreak havoc on the enemy with four airplanes. And, you, and we went through all those scenarios. And then we went to the electronic warfare range so we could learn you know, how our gear sensed the enemy radars. They have simulated enemy radars up at China Lake. And so we, and we did tactics up there too. So the flying, it was once, twice, up to three times a day. When I say intense, typical day could start with a 6 a.m. brief or a 7 a.m. lecture, and then you might have three flights that day, and you might have, or might have two. It was, it was incredible. In terms of forcing you to learn, rather than have, you know, a one a week lecture where things kind of atrophy in between, it was spot on and you lived it. And um, if, you know, when you see the movies about airplanes, you know, it can be physically tiring doing aerial combat. Our airplane was related, rated back then for six and a half Gs. The Hornets are seven and a half, the F-14D was seven and a half. And so um, if you went out and you fought your airplane hard, came back, grabbed a snack, had a, you know, debriefed, and I'll talk about the debriefs in a minute, uh, got into another brief, went out and flew another air combat maneuvering flight. If you did three of those in a day, you were not going to the Oak Club after that. You were going home and you were going to bed because uh, you, you were tired. It was, it was demanding. And I think most, most of you know when you, when you uh, feel the, uh, the G-forces, they teach you this anti-straining, you know, anti-G-force straining maneuver. And so you're constantly tensing up your abdomen muscles to keep the blood up here because not up here is not good. And uh, that keeps you from graying out and all that. And so you're working your whole body. You're working your whole body. Your head weighs, you know, what, 20, 
20 pounds, you got a helmet on, which weighs another eight pounds. You're pulling six and a half Gs, so that's that much weight that your neck is going. A lot of guys work out to keep their neck in shape just so they can do dog fighting. So it was very, very intense, but also you felt like you were making progress. The, the bogey drivers, they were amazing. They were flying their airplanes twice a day, sometimes more, and they knew how to employ that A4. I hated that thing. I hated that A4 because they had taken everything out of it. They had A4s with the biggest motors that you could ever put in an A4, and they took everything out but the radios. So it had a higher thrust to weight ratio than the F14A, and they were so good at flying that airplane. If you made a little mistake and somehow got below an A4, oh my God, that was bad. Because the A4 could do a little pirouette and get behind you, and then it was just embarrassment. You know, let's, let's knock it off, set up for another one, and do better next time. So you learned how to do that. The A4 was representing the MiG-15, the MiG-17, uh, in terms of performance, you know, very maneuverable, but you could beat it if you followed the guidance that the instructors were giving you. I'll go back just for a second. That's a representation of the F5. The F5 was representing the MiG-21. Those were the MiG-17, MiG-21, the Chinese versions of the same. Those were the, the enemy fighters of that day. And it could go fast. It was supersonic, but it would bleed, but it was almost impossible to see. Head on, four miles away, it was just a little tiny dot. And so they would sneak into the fight. That was what they tried to exploit, is that they would come in unseen, because if, if you didn't see them, then they would roll into their weapons envelope and they would prevail. And, and that was what happened in, you know, the, the big aces of World War II said that most of their kills were rolling in behind one of our U.S. fighters unseen. You know, the, the German aces, the Japanese aces, that was their trick. And that's what, so we were trying to learn how to not let that happen. We were doing a weave. We had Rios that were basically looking at our six. Uh, when they weren't looking at the radar, they were looking behind to make sure we didn't get seen. And we were checking our wingman six, and he was checking our six. And that was all designed, and, and, and it was constant. There was no relaxing in a flight like this. The big thing that I learned there, and it's funny, there's a little cottage industry now. If you go to the business section, there are books about how to, how to do good debriefs, right? Debriefs from a, a test event, something I did the rest of my career. Debriefs from a sports game, you know, they, they watch the films, right? They sit in the room and they watch the films and they talk about the mistakes. Um, a lot of industries do this and Top Gun perfected it. The first thing with that ACMI range, the tax range, if it was that kind of sortie, you could see where everyone was the whole time and they would go through in a debrief. The debrief often lasted more than the flight. The debriefs lasted an hour to an hour and a half commonly. The debriefs were not a hey, you did good, I did good, let's go get lunch. No, 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 no. It was, you, you, you wanted to wring as much learning as you can, could from the event. So you, uh, the picture's not that clear, but you can see there's a representation. Uh, it's a God's eye view of the range, if you will, with the good guys in blue and the bad guys in red. And you can actually see in the tax range, you know, they were connected to your weapon system so that when you had a radar lock, it showed in the tax range. You couldn't bluff. You couldn't say, oh, I had a lock. No, it, it would, you know, it, the, the truth was there. Um, the missiles, you know, did you employ it within range? Did you have a good tone for the heat-seeking missiles? All those things were all there, and it was an incredible learning tool, especially when you start talking for the unknown. There's so much out there, and you can figure out, well, okay, where did that group come from? How did they execute their tactics? You know, they would split high, low, uh, wide to try and pince us. And we, in turn, would try and do that to them. If we had a four ship, we would try and use these same tactics to make them, you know, to, to trick them into thinking, oh, oh they, you know, the U.S. only has two fighters out there. Meanwhile, we're sending another two fighters circling around uh, so that they approach them unseen. The debriefing of the, of the actual fights would usually get down, and you can see the models there. So we were taught, as I mentioned a minute ago, you never use your hands. You never use your hands in the debrief. You use the models so you can just simply show what the different angles were. 
Um, the instructor could show you doing a brake turn if you were defending against uh, an ATOL heat-seeking enemy missile, um, could show all the various defensive maneuvers if you were uh, doing guns or what you were doing to nail the bogey. <clears throat> all that could be shown and it would be done very professionally. And it, it sounds simple, but the last thing you wanted, you didn't want learning to be clouded by ego. You didn't want it to be about me and you wanted it to be a learning experience. So you never said people's call signs. Everyone had one. You, in, the brief, in the debrief, it was the fighter did this, the bogey did that, and you kept it third person. You kept it not personal because you didn't want to get focused. In, you know, in the movie, there's a lot of drama uh, and, and all that. That's not what Top Gun was like. The, the Top Gun instructors, the thing they probably disliked most about the movie when it came out was that it showed all the drama, because it's Hollywood. But in reality, you didn't want any of that drama. You just wanted people to be focused on learning from that sortie, and you would dissect those sorties, and it would take a long time. But that's where the learning came. And they were teaching us at that same time how to do that when we went back to our squadron. A lot of egos in a fighter squadron. You have to be pretty confident to be in a fighter squadron. You have to be pretty confident to fly a you know, 70,000 pound airplane off a pitching deck and then come back and it's dark and it's night and you can barely see a thing because it's, you're under the cloud deck. So you want people to be confident, but you don't want that to get in the way of the learning and the teamwork that has to be built within the squadron. So the key lessons I had, uh, and, and I think these apply to a lot of things in life. So you want the detailed debriefs, you want it to be open, honest feedback. You don't want to put the who into it. You don't want to make people feel defensive because then they're not absorbing anymore. They're just thinking, oh, that asshole, you know. <laughs> you want to use the science, and they did that. They, they, they broke it down into, you know, it wasn't, there's an art to flying an airplane at times, but it wasn't, you know, and, and aerial combat can be an art. It's certainly beautiful to be part of, but there's a science behind it. The thrust of the engines, the wing loading, um, all those different things that make one airplane better than another that you want to exploit. Uh, and that's, that's that next bullet. Um, leave your ego at the door and the details matter in the debrief. It, it was so easy to say, hey, we gotta get lunch because we got another brief to do. But Top Gun taught me, no, take the time. And I think it applies in a lot of scenarios. You know, hospitals use it, businesses use it. The other thing that I learned and they emphasized there, they were constantly getting updates on the threat. They were sending those Top Gun instructors to intelligence briefings at DIA and CIA. They were sending them uh, as civilians to foreign air shows so they could look at hardware to see if there was something new out there. Is there a new aperture on that airplane? Is there a new bump on that airplane? What is that? Is that, you know, what, what is in there? And, you know, ask questions. So they were constantly pursuing updated knowledge, and, and I took that away from the Top Gun program as well. So when you, when you finish, Top Gun, you know, it, it's, it, there's a great party, there's uh, much celebrating and jubilation because you made it through without making an, you know, an, an ASS of yourself. Um, and, and sometimes people don't make it through, but you know, you felt really good. You've, and you, now you go back to the squadron and boom, you're the training officer. In a Navy squadron, through your tour is typical means a third of the crew turns over every year, and then they kind of bunch those you know, after the deployment. So that person that was the Top Gun instructor when I joined the squadron, by the time I finished Top Gun, he was gone. You know, and I say he just generically because that was the squadron's end. These days it's he or she, or they. Um, so, so you go back, and you're, you, know, you're, you are now, I mean, people are looking to you, the CO, the skipper, and the department heads, they're looking at you to now bring all that knowledge back and to teach people not only how to fight the airplane, but how to employ the weapon system and how to have a professional environment, you know, the appropriate briefs and debriefs. It was a, it, it's, it's a heavy burden to carry because, you know, they taught you how to do it well, but then you had to not slip into a little bit of complacency. You had to really focus on doing it. You were expected to be the expert. You expected to lead. And it was all about what happens if we go to war. 
what happens if we have to go defend an ally or defeat an enemy that's attacking the carrier or whatever. So pretty weighty. You took it pretty seriously. And you enjoyed it. One of the other things that has been declassified for years now, uh, couldn't talk about it for a long time, is that they actually had, through foreign exploitation, they had some real MiGs. And you would get a chance, uh, either going through Top Gun, usually, or later the squadron, to go fly against the real MiG-17, real MiG-21, the real MiG-23. And you get, you get a chance to see. And the, both the Air Force and the Navy, and the Marine Corps, generically, part of the Navy here, we learn you, you don't want people to see the enemy for the first time on their first combat sortie. When they do those big red flag exercises, which the Navy participates in, the whole idea is to ha have people feel like they've had their first combat sorties, even though no shot was actually fired in anger. So seeing the airplanes would keep you from kind of freaking out when you saw it for the first time. And the constant peg program was the way they did that. So the air wings and the Top Gun students would get a chance to go see. And you could really fight. I mean, we had US pilots flying them. And you could really fight the airplane and see that the lessons you had been taught really worked. So that was a pretty cool thing that I didn't even know about before I went to Top Gun. So a little bit about the movie. So in 1983, this guy, I can't pronounce his name very well, but this gentleman who was writing for California Magazine, which was a thing back then, went and embedded himself in Top Gun to write this article. And actually, the article is mostly about a guy, Yogi Hinarkas, who's a good friend of mine, who unfortunately passed away from cancer uh, two years ago, and uh, Dave Cully, uh, Dave Possum Cully. So he went through with them and wrote about it. And that article was picked up by the Hollywood producers. And they were able to do, you know, it took them two years to negotiate everything with the Navy, but to get the Navy to support the making of the movie. Um, it's out there on the internet if you want to see it. It's pretty good. But I wanted to, so talking about the movie, the movie was cool. I went to test pilot school and I missed the whole filming extravaganza at Miramar. But my buddies were still back there, so I heard, heard a lot about it. Tom Cruise went out with people so he could really get a sense for the culture. The characters in the movie um, spent time uh, in, in the squadron space trying to absorb what was the culture of a fighter squadron like? What was it like to go do combat maneuvering? They all went out and flew. Some puked, some didn't. Um, but they all got a chance to see it. Um, one of the things in the movie was Kelly McGillis. And you probably think that was Hollywood, but actually, that was a real thing. There was a woman there named Christine Fox. She was working for the Center for Naval Analysis at the time, and she was part of the scientific part of Top Gun. She went on later to be the number two person in the Department of Defense in an interim role before she retired. So the character Charlie, actually true, even though you probably thought that was Hollywood. Top Gun trophy, true or false? Well, I hate to say it, there was no trophy. Everyone. Um, you know, there was no trophy. You got a certificate. You got this patch, the most sought after patch at Miramar and Oceana and all places where they fly fighters now. There really was no Top Gun trophy, but it made for good, you know, good movie making, if you will. The Top Gun flying scenes. I think that's where the F-14, uh, un unquestionably, the F-14 became famous because of this movie. We were flying the airplane. We loved it. A lot of people knew about it. But when this movie came out, oh my God, the star of the movie, you know, Tom Cruise or the F-14? <laughs> I think the F-14 was the star of the movie. And the flying scenes were incredible. And I think one of the things that made the movie so popular was that it was easy to imagine what air combat maneuvering was like. Yeah, there were some funny things there. So. They painted up the F-5s to look like bad guys. They did all this filming with a Clay Lacey Learjet, plus they put cameras all over the airplane. And so, you know, the average person, your kids, you know, anybody could actually watch the movie and get a sense of what it was like to fly the F-14. And people loved it, of course. Now, the upper right photo, pretty famous, you know, where they're upside uh, of the MiG <clears throat> and Tom Cruise flips them off. Yeah, not, not so much, that was not real. 
That did not happen. But, but uh, you know, people like Bio Baranek that were in the filming of the movie and, and others say, you know, they, they, the, the company did not scrimp on getting real aerial footage. They got footage on the Enterprise. They got footage uh, right off the coast of Southern California in the warning areas. And, and uh, I mean, the footage speaks for itself. But those flying scenes were real. Other than the, you know, upside down uh, and giving the bad guy your, uh, your friendly sign, you know, it, it was real. The, the only CGI in the movie was when the bad guy airplanes would explode. You know, be, or, or, you know, somebody was damaged and they showed the crew bailing out and they, the bailing out, the ejection, you know, that was CGI too. But all the flying scenes, I, I, and I, I think it's a rarity now. Now CGI is so good that you're not really sure a lot. Back then, that was all real. All real footage, all people out there in their flight suits working their butts off to, you know, create a scene that was very similar to what they were trying to do in training all the time. And, and, and I, think, I think it speaks for itself. It's very, very good. So, Top Gun sequel, true or false? Uh, it's in the can. It's supposed to come out now in May. It's been delayed two or three times. I hope they don't uh, delay it again. And I know uh, Bruce actually has uh, a trailer. Uh, I think, Bruce, you're going to let it run while we're doing Q&A, right, the trailer? Yeah, so, we'll, so you have a chance to see it, but it's, it's easily found on any internet station. And I do want to do a plug before we go into Q&A for the F-14 Association. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Mike. So I, I'm the president. I am biased, but we have associations that try and keep the legacy of the airplanes alive. And the F-14 Association, it's mostly a social group. It's not a nonprofit. But we do things to keep the legacy of the airplane alive, and we do things to support the static displays so that, you know, the museums that get them, sometimes they need assistance on, you know, what was the color of paint the Navy was using, how do we keep the nose strut from collapsing, those kinds of things. So it's $25 a year. If you're interested in uh, the F-14, I, I would recommend it. But again, I'm biased. And with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. So I'll take questions here, and then we'll go out by the airplane, and I'll take more. You, sir. Yeah, when did the F-14 retire? The F-14 retired. I'll come to you in a second. Here's somebody right behind you, too. <clears throat> the F-14 retired in 2006. Um, a very sad day for me. I was there to see the last flight. Um, but that's what happens in the, in the Navy and, and in all the services, you know, the planes they go through their life cycle, and new planes come along, so now it's the Super Hornets and the F-35s, and, and that's the way it goes. But 2006 was the last, uh, the retirement. Yeah. Yes, sir, Biden. Yeah, I got two questions. One is, um, the, the Gatling gun? Kind of a yeah, we did have one. So the second question was, why didn't, why didn't we put a Gatling gun in the airplane? Uh, and, and then the other question was, how did the airplane handle when it was loaded up with weapons. Is that fair? Okay. So the Gatling gun, it does have the, the Mark 61 20 millimeter Gatling gun. It's not the same gun that the A-10 had, which you may be thinking about, which was the tank killer. But it did have, you know, you carried about 700 rounds of 20 mic mic ammunition. In, we used 50 round bursts. So you got, you know, 10 bursts with the gun. 50 rounds each, and that, that high, uh, high, the HEI ordinance was very lethal. I mean, it was, if you hit somebody with it, it was gonna do some serious damage. So we did have uh, a Gatling-like gun, you know, with the rotating barrels in the F-14 from day one. That was in from day one. Yeah, and then, oh, wait one second, I wanna answer the other question. The other question was, how did the airplane handle? So the F, uh, F-14, basic weight, you know, I went through the slides there, you know, 42,000, 43,000, 44,000. The Phoenix missile was 1,000 pounds, <clears throat> and then the rails that you put it on were 500 pounds. So if you had two rails and two Phoenix, that's an extra 3,000 pounds. And then the Sparrows were 500 pounds, and the Sidewinders were about 200 pounds. And so if you were loaded up with two, two, and two, you would feel a difference in the performance of the airplane. And if you had the drop tanks on, which we typically flew with at sea, you know, you had to be at a lower fuel weight to pull the six and a half Gs. The acceleration would be a little slower. 
But if you were smart, if you took the lessons learned, you could still employ the web system. But as a pilot, could you feel it? Yes. A heavier, heavier airplane, you know, was uh, a little more sluggish, uh, but you could still you could still prevail against the enemy. When they put the big motors in with the F-14 B and D, now it didn't seem to make much of a difference at all. You could go you could go supersonic in the A with all that stuff on it. In the D, you could go supersonic in military power without even afterburner. So performance was pretty good. Over here, sir. So the um, the Vietnam War kind of drew to a close in '73. In fact, the F-14 was uh, there when we evacuated from Saigon in 19. They were on their first deployment when we evacuated Saigon in 1975. So the F-14, the kill ratio improved during Vietnam. It just the F-14 wasn't really part of it. Um, and these days, the kill ratio. Uh, in exercises on that ACMI range are in that, you know, above 10 to 1 ratio, just depending on which enemy platform and what their weapon system is. So, so definitely was effective. Over there. Okay, this is a loaded question. Number one, I'd like to know the slide. Sure. So he was asking about some of my stats. So um, I have 2,700 hours in the F-14, 1,000 hours in the F-18, and another 1,000 hours in various other airplanes for a total of 4,700 hours. Uh, in the F-14, I have 700 carrier landings. Uh, I think I have 20 in the F-18, and all the rest are in the F-14. Now that, in the Navy, people don't exaggerate much because their friends know if they are. So I will tell you <laughs> that of those 700 plus landings, a lot of them are touch and goes when I was at carrier suitability. We would do a lot of passes with the hook up to make sure the automatic carrier landing system was working. So not all of those were with hook engaging the cable. Actual traps, I think I'm at about 683. Um, what, what else did you? Oh, night. Yes, definitely. We flew, and when you were in a squadron, especially when you were in your first tour, every third flight was at night. They flew you at night a lot. Why did they do it? Because it was dark and it was scary and it was hard when the ship was moving. I, I, and I, I'll just digress for a second and tell you, flying in the daytime was magnificent. All those Top Gun sorties, they were all in the daytime. It was all fantastic. When you really kind of earned your pilot pay was at night when there was no moon and you came down and you went through a layer of clouds and you could actually not even see the little bit of light that the ship was emitting until you were about a mile away. You're all on your instruments. Your body's trying to tell you that you're upside down, but you're on your instruments. And I, yeah, I've done that more than 100 times, for sure. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Last thing, and then we'll take the rest of the questions. So my first squadron was VF-14. And then I went to what was then the Pacific Missile Test Center, flying the F-14, doing a lot of missile testing. And then I went to VF-213. And those of you who know the air wing structure, those, they were sister squadrons. Going back to your sister squadrons, always a little bit weird. Because you know, you've been kind of talking bad about them for three years, and then you are one. Uh, uh, then I went uh, back to Pax River and flew with the Strike Aircraft te Test Director, which later became VX-23. Um, and I, I did a tour in, in the Pentagon on the Joint Strike Fighter, and then I was Naval Test Wing Pacific at Point Magoo when I retired. So two operational deploying squadrons and three different test squadrons, basically. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go to the side of the room. I'll come back to you. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit about the TF-30 engine? Sure. So the question was about the TF-30. If I could talk about it a little bit, I might have to call on my lifeline, Mike Seminera. But Basically, the, there was a fighter competition, a fighter development program going on at the time, but they were out of sync. So the TF-30, Pratt & Whitney TF-30 was put in there. It was used in other airplanes too. Um, so it was a proven platform and it was supposed to just be the first 30 airplanes, you know, give or take. <clears throat> it was not, the weakness of the TF-30s I think were twofold. One was uh, it didn't have as much thrust as you wanted. And the other is that it would have compressor stalls during air combat maneuvering. So if you were doing air combat maneuvering 
uh, you're not flying the airplane straight and level. I didn't bring my model with me. You're, you know, you're putting the airplane up to 30 degrees angle of attack, and you're using the rudders to horse the airplane around so you can point at the enemy. And all that disturbed air down the inlet, the, F, the TF-30 didn't like it very much. The F-110 was almost stall proof. The TF-30, not so much. There also were some things that they did while I was in the, the F-14 to um, contain a blade failure and some other things. So uh, it was, uh, and I, this is not uh, a hit on Pratt & Whitney, they make fine products. But when I went to Miramar, the saying was, if it says, you know, Pratt & Whitney, it better say Martin Baker. <laughs> and sad, but you know, that was, I mean, the, 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 later on, the good news is, is they fixed the TF-30, so it was much more reliable in, in terms of stall, you know, they had to adjust the airflow and in terms of, uh, you know, containing blade failures. So the, the TF-30 was reliable up to the end, but it never had the thrust that that big F-110 engine had. So, yeah, he, he used the word lame in the question. I, I wouldn't say the F TF-30 was lame, but I loved the bigger engine and the thrust. I'll go there next. So um, I had a lot of engine stalls in the F-14. He asked if I ever flew the F-5, I'll come back to that. I had uh, a lot of engine stalls in the F-14, but it always, you know, they would either self-recover, or you'd shut it down and you could restart it. So I never had one that wouldn't restart. Well, maybe once on a maintenance check flight, but it was a rarity. Um, I did fly the F-5. I got to fly in the back seat at Top Gun. You, you know, they would put you in the back seat because you could see the bogey's point of view. And then at test pilot school, I had about 70 flights in the T-38, which is very similar. So a very cool airplane. If I was going to have my own airplane in my garage, I would pick the T-38 or the F-5 because it's very simple to maintain and, and all that. But uh, yeah, yeah. You, sir. Two questions. Uh, first one, Well, um, so two questions there. One is how do we deal with the stress of air combat and going through Top Gun? And the other was where did they get the enemy airplanes? So I can't completely answer your question about where they got the enemy airplanes because there are relationships with other countries involved but suffice it to say that um, through intermediaries they were able to obtain or acquire or buy things now now if you're rich you can just go buy one you know it's amazing you can go buy a mig-29 right now uh, probably for under a million dollars but good luck with the maintenance costs uh, the um, the stress of going through the course was, first of all, you know, I, I'm not the svelte figure I once was, but at the time, when you're in a squadron, you've got physical standards you've got to maintain, you have to be in shape. As I said, a lot of people worked out to keep, you know, have good neck muscles and to be able to uh, understand the rigors or to withstand the rigors of, of the air combat maneuvering and all. Um, mental stress, you know, it was just part of the toughness you learned and the physical stress, you dealt with it by, you know, eating right, not drinking too much, and by, you know, taking care of your body. Um, the Navy physiologist taught you how to, you know, do the anti-G straining maneuvers and how to, to do things. And if your life support equipment didn't fit right, you know, I mean, if you were going through Top Gun and your helmet was pinching you somewhere or something, you just got it fixed. You, know, you didn't have to put up with uh, substandard equipment. We, we, we had good equipment and, and even the equipment kept getting better. Now they have pressure breathing and, and other stuff, but, but, but you, had to, you had to have some perseverance. You, sir. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, I was making a little bit of a joke. No, no, it's okay. So the Pratt & Whitney engine was replaced by the General Electric F-110 engine and Martin Baker made the ejection seats. And I apologize to anybody from Pratt Whitney that didn't like that joke. Yeah. Well, we had, we had an annual Navy fitness. So he asked how I did, what was my fitness regimen, was the question. And I think if you found people that were in the squadron with me, they, you know, they would say I was okay, but not, you know, I was not a tip top athlete. Um, but I would, you know, we did three mile runs frequently. Um, on the ship, there were weight rooms and the exercise bicycle. We would run on the flight deck. Uh, and, and a lot of it was aerobic because you wanted to be able to have good oxygen exchange in your lungs as you're pulling all those G's and things. Um, a lot of people you know, were very avid you know, weightlifters and things too. Uh, I, I, nobody would have called me an avid weightlifter, but I did enough to, uh, you know, to be able to withstand the environment 
and, and to keep fit. It was important. You, sir. Right, so the question was, you know, attrition in the class. And, you know, every class is a little bit different. Um, like I said, when I went through, we had 12 airplanes, F-4s, F-14s, and then the, two, the one section of Hornets. Uh, nobody washed out of my class. Everybody was, everyone completed the training. Um, I mean, the squadrons typically aren't going to pick somebody that's going to not, you know, not succeed in the course. So there's that pre-screening. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if, if a medical issue came up and somebody couldn't complete the course, it, you know, the flight surgeons, and if there are any flight surgeons here, don't take any offense to this, but the flight surgeons were the enemy. They're, we always felt like they were trying to ground us. But somebody could get, you know, have a, a bad infection or something where they couldn't fly for a while. And if they were lucky, they'd get rolled into a later class. And some people just, you know, frankly, there were a few, rarity, but there were a few that just couldn't keep up. Yes, sir. Okay, so two questions there. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the first one already. So th let me answer the second one first, and then I'll come back. So did the Tomcat carry anything other, did it carry anti-ship weapons? And it could have, but we didn't. They put the anti-ship weapons typically on the A6, A7, S3, uh, and there were some really good weapons out there, but they didn't. We, we actually did fit checks at Point Magoo of those weapons, so we, we could have, but they just never put them on the F-14. And the first question again? Oh, it was the, the two and a half to one oh. kill ratio. Yeah. yeah. So, so the first question, which I forgot, which he reminded me was, the two, to, two and a half to one kill ratio in Vietnam, was that all air to air? Or did that include the SAM missiles? Because the surface to air missiles were a, you know, a very potent threat in Vietnam. They had, you know, they had a lot of them that they got from our not quite so friendly Russians and Chinese. And they used them a lot, and um, and I, I think that the 2.5 to one was air to air, but I'm not certain. Okay, Mike's saying yes, yeah, yeah. So there were a lot of airplanes lost in Vietnam due to surface air missiles, but that's not what was in that stat. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the question was, when we're out, out, you know, in that environment, was it all by voice commands or? Did we have other electronic tools to help us? And the answer is the latter. Uh, in the F-14, we had a fighter to fighter data link. And so you could see, even in the A, you could, even, you could see where your wingman was. I mean, you wanted to keep he or she in sight, but you could see where they were and you could see if they had a radar lock or not. You couldn't necessarily see what their radar lock was, but you could see if they had a radar lock or not. So you had that as a tool, and that became really important when you were doing division tactics for airplanes. The comms were very important. We had comm brevity. You don't want to garble up the air with somebody just kind of rambling on. So we had very precise comm brevity where you had certain words that were used. And, um, you, know, you know, it would be lions, section, bogeys, 30 miles, right one o'clock, and then you would stop. So somebody could say, okay, I've got a radar lock on them. And everything was meant to be very crisp so that you could keep track of it all. So as you're listening, you're flying the airplane, you're looking at the radar display. The Rio's got a raw radar display and a tactical information display and the uh, electronic warfare gear <clears throat> and all that advanced as we went to the F-14D. But you know that was part of the art of it was maintaining situational awareness and thankfully, we had the fighter to fighter data link. And even today's airplanes, the F-35, the F-22, um, F-18 EF, they all have some version of data link. Sometimes the two systems don't talk to one another, but they all have a way to help maintain that situational awareness. Yes, sir. So Roy, our retired North Grumman chief test pilot, Given a plug to North Grumman, which is fine because I'm an employee of North Grumman, so that's all good. Just talked about how they had a very robust um, uh, filming unit, uh, audiovisual filming unit here, and they were a big part of the footage that's so exciting in the movie Top Gun. They flew uh, in sometimes in the adversary airplanes, they flew in Clay Lacey's airplane, although he had this really cool mount that he could control from inside the airplane. So it had 360 degree coverage, but yeah, they were, all those people were kind of the heroes of the movie. We think of 
you know, Tom Cruise and Val Kilmer and all those as the heroes, but the people that made the movie, you know, are names you don't see, but they were amazing. Thanks, Roy. Yeah, if you, I know you couldn't hear Roy, but he was talking about Art Scholl, who was well, one of the pilots. He unfortunately perished in the filming. He had cameras all over his airplane, uh, they, and he did some of the spin uh, footage, and unfortunately that, it, that does happen all too frequently. Uh, probably the most famous F-14 pilot of all time is Snort Snodgrass, and he perished this past summer, <clears throat> in a, not in an air show, but in a crash uh, in Wyoming. Yes, ma'am. He was I scared. Not that I'd admit in public. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, I, I, I will say there was one time I was scared. We were the uh, we had offloaded um, some of the people in the Philippines. The question was, was I ever scared flying off the carrier? Did I ever have an incident? Um, and um, we actually went out to man up the airplane. Sorry, sexist terms. Apologize. That's just the language we used. We go out to man up the airplane, and the deck is doing these big pitches and rolls because there was a typhoon near us. That's why we were pulling out of the Philippines to not be at harbor when the typhoon hit. So we we were out there, and I was flying with a. This was actually my second tour, and I was flying with a young guy. And as we're pre-flighting, he kind of looks at me and says, "Are you okay?" And, and I, I hadn't realized how obvious it was, but I was kind of scared because the deck was really moving and it was going to be a night landing. <laughs> and I was just thinking, oh, this is going to be bad. Now, the way it works is if you come back and the deck is moving and you're out of sync, the LSOs wave you off. It doesn't count against your grade point average. And you go around again, but it has happened before where people go around three times, then they go to the tanker, then they go around three more times, and they go to the tanker and, and et cetera, until they eventually get on board, or if you're close to a friendly country, they may say, okay, the conditions are too bad, you know, go to go back to the Philippines or something. So I, I was actually feeling a lot of anxiety that day, because I knew what a night recovery like that was gonna be. I was a landing signal officer, so I knew all of that. And I was, I was gonna go, but I was not comfortable. And I was so happy when the air boss came up on the 1MC and said, now on the flight deck, the launch is canceled. <laughs> Second question. Yeah, that's the quickest way to lose your wings ever. Yeah, the question was, have I ever buzzed a tower? Now, I have enjoyed the occasional low level on the appropriate range, and, and it is exciting, but if you buzz a tower in real life, you're either not ever going to fly again, or you're going to be like in the in the pokey for six months, you know, theoretically. Yes, sir. Is that the control tower you buzzed? That was not me buzzing the control tower, but in the movie, that was the yeah the control tower at Miramar. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. How was the uh, Top Gun program of Russia and what they're like? Yeah. The question was, you know, the Russian and Chinese Top Gun, you know, comparison, and I honestly have no idea. I mean, I know that when, when I was, you know, in this time frame in the 80s, the Cold War was still going, we had a lot of intel on the pilots, and what we were often told is that the Soviet and the Chinese pilots didn't get to fly very often. You know, where we might fly at sea 20, 25 times a month, and back at Miramar, the average was probably 10 or 12 times a month, they were flying two or three times a month. And that gave us confidence that they would be rusty. But as far as their own you know, training schools, fighter weapons type school, I, I, I just really don't know. So we're gonna do three more questions and then we'll go out by the airplane and I'll keep answering questions all day. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was, how do you get paired up with the Rio? How does that relationship go? And how do you, you know, kind of divide and conquer with the responsibilities? So um, when you are first in a squadron, you get assigned an experienced Rio. Maybe a lieutenant commander, maybe an experienced lieutenant, because they want to figure out, can you, you know, are you dangerous? I mean, I, just plain and simple, are you dangerous? So they want somebody experienced with you and somebody that can help coach you and give you the right information. When you're coming back to the ship, there's certain things the Rio can say about your airspeed, for example, that prevents you from getting slow. So, so they give you somebody really experienced, and then later on, on, on the opposite end, when you're back as a lieutenant commander yourself, you're flying with a really inexperienced Rio, 
and um, you get assigned somebody, but if it's a personality mismatch and if it's not working, they'll, they'll break it up. They'll, they'll, um, they'll assign you to somebody else. For the most part, I mean, getting along with people when you're going to be on a carrier for eight months is pretty important. So most people, you know, can get along quite well. The way the responsibilities were divided up, um, in the A and in the D a little bit, you, you had some control over the radar, but that was the domain of the radar interceptor. The radar was the domain of the radar intercept officer. When later on, when we had IRST, the infrared search and track, sometimes the pilot would operate the infrared search and track so that the Rio could focus on the radar. Because you know, there's a lot there there. You're changing modes, you've got certain things you can do to trying to defeat jamming and things. The Rio would also operate the electronic warfare. Usually the Rio would do the, the, uh, the comms with the outside agencies. He would do all the comms with the ship when you were coming back and for the approach and whatnot. And the pilot would typically do interflight comms. So the pilots, if they're talking about, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, uh, I wanna come in high out of the sun as we prosecute this attack, it, it, that kind of comm is pilot to pilot and the weapon system communication, the radar targets, and you know, those kind of things were between the backseaters, the Rios, and it worked. We had two radios, pilots talked on one, the Rios talked on the other, and you just tried really hard not to step on one another. So, okay, I wanna do a plug again. So this is uh, Bio Baranex, uh book, Top Gun Days. I, I highly recommend it. You can get it from Amazon or a lot of places, and he's again, he's got three books out there. I urge you, please support this facility, the museum, Western Museum of Flight. Um, it would be just horrible if they had to collapse down to one hangar or something else because of financial reasons. So, so please uh, support the museum. And I would ask anybody that's interested to join me at that beautiful F-14 out there, and I'll be happy to answer more questions. Thank you.